it's good morning here and good afternoon where Jimmy is in yeah, the, in, sure in, the is. in the Shatin somewhere in Queensland. Um, hey. Welcome, Jimmy. It's an absolute pleasure to have uh, a fellow RLI. Uh, you were three commander as well, weren't you? A two commander. Oh, you were two commander. Okay, we can forgive yeah. you for that. Um, <laughs> Hannes was also in two commanders. <laughs> see. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jimmy, thanks so much, man. Um, I don't know where you want to start. Uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe tell us a little bit about, um, you know, like where you, where you were born and went to school and, and how you ended up in the Rhodesian army. Okay. Uh, Guinea Fowl School. Started okay. off in Hartley Junior with oh, um, wow. a whole whack of oaks there. And then I, well, my parents lived in Zambia and then we, um, we used to go back and stay with our granddad, who was the mayor of Salisbury in those days, James Watson Swan, which is I'm also named after him. By and, the way, um, by the way, yeah. Jimmy, I, I also went to Hartley Junior for a while. Bloody hell. You know, what, you year know what year was you know the Anglican Church across the road? No. <laughs> yeah, at Hartley Junior, there was a church on the corner there opposite the school. Yeah. And next to, the, next to the church was the was the rectory. So I used to walk across the road to go to school. It was it was uh, my dad oh, yeah. was the, my dad was the Anglican priest in Hartley. But anyway, that's oh, Lord. enough of me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So carry on. You were talking about your dad. Yeah. So my granddad was mayor of Salisbury in those days, and then after that, I went back to uh, Highlands Junior, and then in Salisbury, and then my old man said no. Nope. We've got to get your ass up to boarding school. So they tried to get me to Plumtree, which was his school, um, but I couldn't get in. And then we went to Guinea Fowl, which the Plumtree Oaks will tell you that I got the second best. <laughs> and, um, and then, uh, uh, and yeah, I did my time there, left Guinea Fowl, joined the tobacco industry. Um, I got my national service. I had to do a two independent company. I was a TF in it. I did a year in Kariba independent company and i was lucky there because even though i couldn't stand it you know just doing the typical slogging through the body hop bush and whatever and not seeing much we um i was one of the few guys that got called in by the scouts to help them build wapa wapa because we had a scout camp up in two in there where ant white and all the guys used to live up there in our barracks area and then we did what was called a walk-in fire force because we couldn't get choppers because rli had them all or the sass or whatever so I, I went out on tracking uh, uh, on the Zupra. So they'd come across and infiltrate, you know, the valley. And then we would find spores through either necrotopy. And then we'd go on tracks. And because there were two or three sticks of us, and they wanted to do the full 360 surveillance of picking up spore and whatever, we got trained. So we were working with guys like Bush Pig and White um, and um, Stretch Franklin. Uh, Zingai, Sad Zingai, and so we were taught the tracking principles. So we actually used them. It was quite nice. So the end of my uh, in debt was okay. Um, Buggered off to England, got asylum there. Eventually met a guy called Major Lamprick. I nearly got involved with a guy called John Banks, which was that group who went to Angola with that Mad Mike Callan guy. So I got very close to that. I was going to go for training in a place called Press Tatnan. Well, anyway, long story. So I didn't, and I, I joined up and um, came back uh, and joined the RLI. Uh, I had to redo my recruit course. I was a corporal in the TFs. Mm -hmm. I did the LTU course there, but obviously I had to start with no rank in RLI. Uh, I did my classical and coin. On coin, it was great because they used me as a tracker. So I was up front all the time, having an easy time with the instructors. And then, um, yeah, I went to the commandos in 76 uh, with a big intake, 150, which was a big intake, one of the biggest. And um, joined two, and uh, yeah, I've never looked back really. It was good, you know, good experience. Started off a bit slow, but my God, when it picked up, as you know, it got uh, crazy. Mm -hmm. You, your intake 150, that was about 10, um, 10 intakes after me. I was 140. Um, okay. I think the RLI had matured quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, from when I joined in 74 to, to you know, January 77. Yeah, happened. maybe tell us a little bit about your feelings about that. Oh, I mean, it just changed the whole unit change because 
we started doing more specialized things. And I mean, if you tell, take 77, um, everything started happening, you know, political. Um, and we were put in the para role in early 77. Some went to Bloom, somewhere went to uh, Serum. I did Serum. And once we did the para, of course, there was more to come. So RLI started, got involved with combined special ops, com ops, and our elite units, SAS and scouts, uh, would find it very useful because we were so good on our fireboards and combat in all different spheres, no matter where they dropped us, we handled it. And big numbers. So what happened was um, we joined com ops and um, we still con continued with our fireboards. Uh, other roles would include externals all the time, doing our own ops, helping scouts and SAS. So often scouts would take us or SAS would take us or we'd go off on a recovery. And if they got compromised and taken out, we would go and do the rescue, which was always very dangerous. But then there was the other side. Our ally actually was probably had the most foreigners by far. I, I believe we were up to 40%. I don't know, I could be corrected. In the commando that is not based, I'm talking about actual operations. And the ones who were good, because some struggled, some came out with stories and, and some struggled. But, you know, we had some really, really good foreigners. And, you know, Billy Metcalf, who went back and joined the army over there and actually went to Falklands and got shot over there. Um, Fraser Brown. Fraser was a sergeant in 10 Troop. I worked with him when I was in 10 Troop for Troopy. And then he joined the uh, British SAS. After the RLI, so had a great grounding there. He came from the Scots Guards, and then he started a company after that in, I think it was, it's called the Ennis, en, Ensis or something, which was a, a very powerful security company in Iraq, and he employed RLI. So, Wasn't he a W01, um, Fraser Brown? In SAS. Right. So he was... In SAS. He was a sergeant with us. Yeah. And then I think he worked his way up before he retired to W01. So, yeah, yeah. he was he was... a successful yeah well what i would call a a true regular soldier where i was just looking for the war you know guys like him were in the military all their lives and so the maturity came and you could see that rli had to step up i mean they wanted to be in the same arena as the elite units and and we were we were proven hardcore in combat but we had to step up a little bit and start maturing and i think rli brought its own uh, without doubt to combined operations um and as you know the combat that our ally were involved in was quite severe um and um you know we probably the i don't know i think i mentioned i believe and please get me if i'm wrong just correct me or whatever but i think we lo lost around 100 men three times that wounded from between most between 77 and 80 and i think um I think I was told at one time um, we had up to 30% casualties. Now, I think that came from Colonel Bates, who was one of my favorite leaders, and Tufty Bates. He may have mentioned that the Saints, but I don't know how long that lasted, that 30%. But I would say that when we had only 60 strong in the commandos, per commando, that meant we were only 250 strong operational any one time, covering literally the whole of Rhodesia and doing this. And so... I mean, it wasn't uncommon, uh, John, for us to fly six times in a week and have 16. You know, Andy Samuels was decorated with Bronze Cross with, with me and, and, and Simon Godley's stick. Um, we had six scenes in one week. So, you know, it was a busy, bad unit. Mm. <laughs> That's mm. different scenes, you know. Mm. So, yeah, mm. it, I think we matured. We had to. And we got included and involved in all sorts of things from canoeing up from Decker Drum into Zambia, all sorts of things. So, yeah, I, I, it was a good thing. And our foreigners helped us, without a doubt. Uh, obviously, there were lots of changes as you guys just adapted and evolved. Um, and, uh, you know, things like um, your webbing. Perhaps tell us a little bit about that. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, okay, I was an MAG gunner, so it never really applied to me. But, um, but you know, I see you modified... Um, a lot of the uh, terrorist uh, uh, yeah. chest webbing yeah. and that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we would then, on the front of that, we would put on another four pouches. So we would then sew, use the AK webbing, 
double up. Then we put four parts on front, which actually made you a bit top heavy, but then our backpack would straighten our back up again. Then on our hips, so we would do 13 magazines. And it sounds a lot, but I can tell you what, when you, you know, you have a big scene, then they leave you behind, which was very common, or you get surrounded by bloody tanks or whatever we got up to. End of the day, you won every single round. And um, we got really good and uh, efficient with our shooting, you know, the Drake shoot, two tapping likely cover. The, we were, um, look, we got efficient, but we had to have the ammunition because we would come up against big numbers. Uh, so 13 mags would be a reasonable amount. We would all carry at least one to two belts for our gunner. We'd always carry our own drip. We'd always carry our own morphine. And the drip was a beautiful pillow as well. And remember the savvy became the most incredible uh, bed, uh, sleeping bag uh, and jacket. So we would be hucking those poor old Saviaks. I think by the time they hit the ground, they hadn't even uh, simmered yet and we were slicing the bloody thing. So, <coughs> um, and um, so, it, you know, but we would really stock up. We'd have the nine grenades on our hips, always take the top, make sure we kept the pins in. Um, We'd have WP M962s, the odd bunker bombs we carry the stick. Uh, the odd claymore would be in the backpack case of ambush. Mini flares, uh, smoke grenades. So literally, you were a a walking bloody ammo dump. You know, you uh, there's nothing we couldn't handle. Four man stick with that much stuff, we could blast anything. Uh, and as you know, <laughs> one of the portraits of the RLI was because we enjoyed our our business. We liked what we did. Um, yeah. I think I noticed uh, from the short time I was in the SAS to to the long time or longer time I was in the RLI was a wonderful esprit de corps, uh, which seemed to be almost unique, you know, to the RLI. It was a it was a real bond between the the, the brothers, you know. Even now, I mean, you know, you mentioned the other day, the RLI is sort of the glue between the units. And if you think about it, you just look on Facebook. I mean, I don't get as involved as maybe some, but I, I can tell you now that being the chairman of the operation here, when it broke apart and there was a big fallout, I, my, me, Digger, Richard Johnson, we rebuilt it. And we had 33 Green Berets with six SAS, five Scouts, all marching behind the Rhodesian contingency. We had guys like um, Ian Button Shaw and Tufty Bates and, uh, you know, Sean Ryan, all these guys traveling from abroad to be with us. And it was really fancy. I mean, I sent you a couple of pictures there. Um, mm. But the bonding of the RLI, are you aware that some of our guys lived in bachelor flats, literally in London or wherever in the UK, till good old, uh, you know, they went to the maker. And, um, Guys were still together. They went and joined either Fraser Brown and his Iraq operations or other security operations. Um, I did notice that quite a few of our guys went to 32 Battalion um, <coughs> in South Africa or the Reckies, which was quite nice because they got the recognition because of their skills and apparently did extremely well. Um, so 32 was a kick-ass operation, uh, as you know, in South African Army. Um, but yeah, look, it was just an honor, really, to be involved with the likes of SAS and... Mm. Um, would you, I think it was in 77, um, were you involved in Mapai? Yeah, I did that one as well, uh, up Aztec. What was Mapai in 77? Yeah, I'm in 77. Uh, I'm not sure the exact month. Um, that, we didn't do a lot in 76 of big raids, but of course you had Ram and I. Um, I can't remember those exact dates, but that, that's where we lost quite a few Oaks, uh, Butch Alexander and that. But I, I think in um, 77 we did Aztec, which was Mapai, 24 RLI jumped into Madula Pan. And the scouts column came in. We'd never seen the column. So to see this thing coming down the road with all these bloody gats going off, it was just a scary, scary sight. You know, <laughs> if you were the enemy, you wanted to get the hell out of Dodge, let me tell you. Yes. That was the, 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 the Nyajonya raid. 
So that was, they did that one prior. So I think Nayudzuna, whatever you call it, that was done after Mapai. We held okay. Mapai for seven days. That's where Bruce Collicott landed the deck by shot the takeoff. Right. And, uh, and, and we, um, but we held that, that was held for seven days. And we took our George and Popa, took all the buses and the graders and everything and drove them out, out of um, Orcos. It was unbelievable. Um, never have I seen it like it. And of course, that night we were at the fort with the scouts. They fought, they had a fort there and um, F-O-R-T in other words. And we got Lalad with them at some house. Oh, yeah, it was a real, yeah, a real honor actually, you know, um, and that's one area I won't go into too much detail because there were a few areas that, you know, I, I found was a little bit, um, yeah, not very good. So I, I won't, I won't get into that. Lots of other actually can talk to you about the, the details of that raid. Okay. But uh, yeah, I'll say. Operation Dingo. Yeah. Tell us about that. That's really the, the, the crux of our Ooh. interview today, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> that was full on. I mean, what can we start? I mean, that was just like crazy. You imagine, we we're at Grand Reef doing our normal call outs, flying very regularly. Um, one troop on R and R, and the next thing we get told, right? Fall in, <clears throat> no more telephone calls, no more outings, no more Amtali um, Hotel or wherever you used to go there. And at the end of the week, well, I can't remember what day, the 23rd of November was the strike, whatever day that was in 1978. We will be um, taking off with our SAS and three commando friends. You will be heliborn, and uh, we're going to be pitching a camp which has grown up to 8,000 strong, which is information gathered by the Stanton Cup. Uh, Zanla had basically hidden behind the garrison and become friends that sort of put the garrison there. And of course, you had the talk of Migs and Tet, and there was all this stuff. And there was talk of... Um, so, yeah, you know, we were expecting Strela and we were expecting everything to hit. Uh, obviously, they had the anti-aircraft gun. Um, and we were told there were 8,000 strong in the camp. And they were so cocky that they didn't believe that Rhodesia would even come near them. And then that, that was their biggest, biggest mistake they ever made uh, because they were slaughtered. You know, they were killed. Um, and, you know, often you always feel some remorse, but at the end of the day, those very people would have come in and slaughtered our farmers, uh, white and black, slaughtered. So we sent them to their happy making uh, camping ground. Mm. That was uh, that was a big one. We we had to prepare for that, John. And uh, the preparation. I mean, at no time did I see anyone get scared. They just were excited to be included and involved in such a op. Um, it's what we call the vertical envelopment. It was a very very well practiced and well well rehearsed in, in uh, Rhodesian fire force. RLI was very involved, and then of course. Vertical envelopment means basically you encircle, your blues take one section, your troops another, and you walk in and have stop groups and you drive them into each other and blast them. And so this was very, very popular. And still today, the Australian Defence Force, some groups, they will visit these areas and have a look at how the ops went. But yeah, so then the, the whole week was just basically going through the roles. You were going to use your own KCAR commander. Um, so that remained as is. Um, you never knew who your chopper pilot G car because there were so many, but at the end of the day, we knew most of them by first name. <coughs> the relationship got stronger and stronger as we did so many hundreds of flying hours. Um, so our role was basically to settle in, get our kit ready, get mentally prepared, and keep it top secret. Um, because there was the issue of concerns of a leak in our army by then, you've probably heard Andre Skippers mentioning, we had definite uh, leaks. And so, you know, this was a, a wonderful operation. Uh, like the Scout one, we got in and we blasted and left there with very few casualties. I think maybe only 10 wounded or eight wounded and I think one vampire pilot and one of our guys dead. But, you know, they reckon by the time the wounded had died. There were two and a half thousand casualties in Shimoyo alone um, from that day. So 
but it was a big week for us and it was a matter of us just uh, it's quite amazing Mary, so, uh, there were only 185 Rhodesians yes uh, wow against 8,000 terrorists which wow. is, is a ratio of about 40 to 1. Right? <laughs> That's correct. It is absolutely unreal, John. And that was a thing we had to look at because how would we be able to cover the area? Well, we didn't realize they were going to use us in an L shape, something like that. I wasn't sure exactly, but you drop us down, you have the chopper one side and you had the paras this side, and then you had the blues on that side. And basically everyone would drive them into each other as long as you haven't done the crossfire. It was a big area like I... I'm guessing around 8Ks, I suppose, was huge. Um, and um, it was just unreal. So, yeah, we had to spread out a little bit. So now, remember, the 4K car commander had to bloody have control over this line that was moving through thick bush. I mean, this is full on now. And how many K car commanders? So you would have had quite a few commanders above their own section or sweet mine. But it was, yeah, look, uh, it was a great, great weekend. When we took off finally on the 23rd, we drove to Lake Alexander and all waited for the choppers for the sun to come up, choppers come in, they refueled. So the fuel had been brought in by truck, popped up, and we boarded just on first light. And uh, we were over the target by 0700. And I mean, just remember seeing white teeth, oaks smiling and grinning. I mean, who would think that people would find that bloody funny? And then, you know, that's like, you know, uh, but they put us in fresh force uniform too. You know, we took off all our crazy stuff, Mujiba bangles and what. We had a dress and proper Rhodesian camo and <laughs> <laughs> like fresh force. But yeah, but, um, and it was amazing because we had the, we watched everything happen. So the choppers just stayed outside. They directly over, we stayed out. We had raised from treetop levels, we had flown in treetops, obviously, then stayed up and waited on the outskirts while the bombs and the strapping and that. I mean, you're talking all those planes, and I can't remember how many, but so many, all doing their own thing. The cameras doing low level, the bloody, you know, doing um, the um, hunters doing their thing from out of the clouds straight down, uh, the strapping, the noise. Uh, it was war. That wasn't just contact. That was like full on, you know. Um, and uh, they dropped us down once Once they'd done the initial. We got down, waited, watched the paras come in. It was just an outstanding operation. You know, the Oaks deserve, the, the, the organizers, the Blues. I mean, how could we be alive without the Air Force, it would be impossible. You know, they used to come up as, ah, oh, Swan, we'll see you, you enjoy the floor and, and you know, all that rough stuff on the ground. We're gonna go back for an egg and bacon. But, and yes, they did. But one thing is sitting up there at 800 feet or whatever they were at, they were vulnerable. Both my mates uh, who I knew well, I grew up with was Robin, Kev Nelson, and both were taken out uh, in, in, as the gunners, I believe. Um, so, you know, <laughs> but they were good guys. I mean, we got to really know them and thank God for the blues. They, they saved us. We're hoping next week to interview Dave Jenkins, who was the chopper tech on, um, on the lead K car, um, learned by, I think, Norman Welsh and, um, and uh, with Brian Robinson inside. Yes, um, yes. I think there were seven K cars. Um, seven. Yeah. Yes. That was, uh, imagine yes. that, uh, seven 20 millimeter cage. Um, I mean, you know. Yeah. So hopefully Dave will be able to give us a bit of a, a feel for what it was like flying at 800 feet in the K car, um, in the lead K car. Um, so yeah, the, 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 we're going to run a sort of um, Jamoyo theme for a while, I think. We've had, I've also, uh, I've also, oh, had, John, it was, also interviewed Beaver Shaw, who was on the previous Chamoya at Op Snoopy, you know. So we'll get yeah. Beaver's, uh, Beaver's take on that as well. Uh, and they got, they got shot to pieces. I mean, really, yeah. they really didn't make it out. Yeah. Uh, they had to land in the, yeah. in the, in the middle of the battle somewhere on a little <laughs> copy. <laughs> 
Um, but uh, sorry, I'm interrupting you. Please carry on. Yeah. Yeah, John. So it was. Um, we we watched the Paris come out, and the Paris apparently were actually hit contact literally as they landed. They were full on. Everyone was. They just saw people running, and they were killing straight away. Um, I don't know. They didn't take. I don't know if three commander took casualties. Two commander didn't. Uh, but I, no, three commander must have and um, SAS must have. <coughs> but we didn't take casualties per se. Um, but the moment they hit, suddenly our bush just opened up and oaks were running. But by the time we hit the ground, can you imagine the noise? It was the valley. We were on a ridge. So we watched a lot of it. We watched the fight and the terrors. The noise was, uh, there's no word. I, I was one of the guys who threw a bunker bomb into a trench in Mapai or up Aztec. You know, the scouts sent us in to clear bunkers, good old RLI fodder. And we assaulted the bloody bunkers, but we threw a bunker bomb. The first time we'd ever seen or used one. And we were warned to just open up, you know, open up your body, lay it flat, open your legs, your things, open your mouth, your ears, you know. And when they went off, it was a shocking feeling. When we recovered these oaks, their durhams and everything were out of every orifice. And that day, before we got a strike, but that day, that noise, and that sound, if you were the enemy, forget about it. You honestly, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what you're going to do? You're going to be taken up, I think. Um, it was just a roar after roar after roar, you know, and just power. And even the Vante, they were amazing old girls. You know, they just like, sort of looked like gliders coming in. But, you know, they could blast it. They could do it. Um, and then once that got going, we straight away, the guys running straight into us. And contact, except for the one big one when we got into trenches, um, we really, really got hairy. We called in a snip, a, a vampire attack. Actually, they went off target and put one right into us. I, I don't know how we survived it. We were knocked out. It was a black. I just remember that impact. But we got up, shook off, and bloody started moving on. Um, but it was like they were terrorized. They were running in every direction, probably hoping that they could get taken hostage. But remember, we can't see. We can just hear or see them slithering in the bushes. We had no choice but to take them out or take a chance of us dying. We, we, we took them out. And, you know, if they were unarmed later, we wouldn't know that. But one thing we knew, they were all trained terrorists. And that's a fact, you know? We all, all also know the old tactic of people hiding weapons and claiming that they're just a civilian from Mozambique. That was another tactic. But I don't know what happened to them. You know, who knows? But definitely... Uh, it was a big day, John. I mean, you know, you could hardly see the guy next to you. Um, we had to do bunkers. We had to do uh, buildings, small buildings. It was just a full-on day. And I mean, we were tired. We had run out of water. We were drinking too much. We were slurping. We had four bottles, but we were slurping, you know, with all the adrenaline. We just had adrenaline pumping. Mm -hmm. We punished our water, which we shouldn't have. <coughs> so yeah. we ran out. We couldn't drink the local water. We were scared that it would be poisoned. <clears throat> so, all in all, it was rough, you know, a rough day, but what a success. Um, you know, we were losing sight of our own guys sometimes, and thank God for KCAR keeping us straight, getting back inside, seeing the blokes again. You were often with your four-man unit. That was what you were. And we were having to use the break shoot, i.e. putting me the enemy sometimes, but they were firing at us. So we were just picking lightly cover a meter in front and just turning the ground in a shrapnel, which as you know, was the most incredibly effective uh, type of, of, of shooting. Um, so, yeah, no, uh, Chimoyo was something to remember, that's for sure. Mm. Apparently your goal was to destroy food and water, ammo dumps, transport and infrastructure. Um, did you come across, uh, there were no tanks or anything in that? Not on that one. I never saw any. But apparently some of the oaks, and maybe SAS did, uh, we never came across anything like that. We came across anti-aircraft guns, which we took out. Um, that was a regular thing with us. Uh, anti-aircraft guns, yeah. 
we took them out and then we <coughs> but we saw no uh, no minks no um, no strella we never saw anything like that um, just your typical contact your typical RPDs and you know rocket launchers and uh, we never even came against those someone says there were those Stalin organs or something I never saw one of those um, but uh, yeah so our role was to take out all the anything food uh, water supply infrastructure mobile vehicles try and capture documents try and get um, try and capture high position people i.e your VIP type uh, terrorists and of mm. course there was always that chance that uh, mm. uh, Renio Mike was going to be there and uh, everyone was looking for his ass but mm. We, we, you know, apparently he was out of there, I don't know how soon prior, but definitely, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a hell of a scene. Feeling the impact of that snap and what it did to us, just the knocking us out and the breath taken out of us, it must have, we believe, must have hit some rocks or something hard and gone straight up. We're not sure, but, um, okay. Okay. and, you know, we were down, we saw it coming, we saw it was going to miss, so we were just, hugging that floor full on. Eh? But none of the contacts were that bad. We, we obviously came under some heavy fire, but, you know, we were the bosses there. They were terrorized. If they were firing, it wasn't always that accurate, even though it was on automatic. We took them up. Um, on the way out, when we took, out, took off, we, we did a look back and we noticed that it was just, it was just carnage. I mean, there was just body. And, when we looked up on, there was a large hill and we could just see these little dots that people were evacuating the area, whether it was civvies or whatever, I don't know. But yeah, so we were heading back and um, that's when the chopper pilot said, eh, we've got a problem and we have to ditch in uh, on in Lake Chikamba. And to see your mates fly away was not nice because, you know, we've done work on Kabora Basa and whatever. And you know that <laughs> and you left alone or something like that. I mean, Bush Telegraph's fast, I don't know. Um, someone wants to give you a beating, that's for sure. So we uh, were very happy when the chopper came back and brought a park. So what we think they did is they went to either Grand Reef, quickly took a part from one of the choppers that got back and brought it back to us, fixed it, but it was already pitched off by then. Sure. Um, and then... Um, we flew back to Lake Alexander. Uh, it was a long day, John. We were worn out. I mean, you know, it was buggered. And then we um, flew on to Serum. And when we get there, we thought, right, on the town, you know, ouzo and cokes and cream sodas, whatever we drank, to be told, go and shower. You're not going anywhere. And we'll brief you. And we got pretty brief that we were doing Kemwe in two days' time. So we, you know, just come out of that day getting through that sort of thing, over the adrenaline of so many people, all that, to, to suddenly think there was no one else to do it. What about the other? But anyway, when we look back now, we're very proud because two commando jumped the DC-7. We'd never been in the DC-7. And we were dropped in with the, these a massive conical, bigger than us, mortars and everything you can think of. There was fuel on board. Um, and we, um, we were a stock group. We also had all the refueling. We had all the mortars, uh, 60 mil and everything. And we, um, but that was where they threw us out. We were told by the pilot later, 200 feet. When we jettisoned our conicals, they went straight into the top of the tree. Folks were upside down. <laughs> A friend of mine, Jeremy Hall, he was, I think he's, you know, he was upside down. I mean, geez, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, but we never actually, so that day, um, we never had any skirmishes. Uh, so it was, you know, everyone else got stuck in and we were just um, sitting waiting to support them. So, you know, we had our fun two days prior, more than. And, and Tembu was much smaller. You know, I'm not sure what, I can't remember what they took out there, but it was um, quite a lot smaller. Yeah. It's still significant yeah. because remember the message was sent to the terrorists, Zanla and to Frelimo, and to the Western uh, left-wing bastards. Don't mark around Rhodesia. 
you come across, you kill our, our farmers and our civilians and our black residents and abduct and take away dissidents, we're going to come and sort you out. So that was good. I thought it was a great message and I was proud of being part of that, you know. Um, yeah, it was a hell of a thing, John. I tell you, it is easy, very hard to really go into the details because it's too sensitive, really, isn't it? You know, you too much happened. You don't want to be talking about some of it because it was violent. It was just violent, you know? And that's what war is. We were trained to annihilate bad people, and we did. Mm. In no uncertain mm. terms, we took them out. Mm. <clears throat> you know? I uh, interviewed um, Log Enslin, who was with Support Commander at the time. Um, and he, and they also were at Tembwe. Yeah. And he's, he also said yeah. that um, it was completely different to Chimoyo. Yeah. Uh, and they had a, quite a few kills, but he said nobody shot at them the whole day. They weren't shot at. Wow. Wow. Uh, and, um, and they also <laughs> they had... Out the terrorists. Yeah. They also had Indeed. helicopter problems on the way home, and they had to land in the, on a... On a as like a waterlogged floating island on, on Kabura Basso <laughs> and wait for, uh, and I think fuel, they, I think they, they, they ran out of fuel because the, um, obviously the yeah. or, or, or tanks had been hit. Um, and uh, I think that Jack Malik's DC-7 that you, that you traveled in came, yeah. and, came and dropped them uh, some yeah. fuel. Yeah, that's what they did. Had to drop them half empty so that they would float, you know. Yes. Uh, so that the Can guys you believe could... it. <laughs> yeah. um, wow. And you know, uh, Tony Merba, um, I was trying to find the tech who was on our flight, who went down. And uh, I spoke to Tony, who's in Malawi, and he was actually the tech on that um, Kubora Basa down um, uh, chopper. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it was Tony Murban. He was he was actually the tech there. Sure. Um, but John, I, I would love to give more details, but I think that all the nitty gritty, we don't need to go in there because really at the end of the day, we're not doing this for the principles of hurt or rubbing in sore salt. We, what we want to do is maybe just a little education. The principles were a small number went into a big group and through our training and uh, controls and uh, dedication, um, we took them out and with minimum losses on our side. And you know, the commandos here used the statement strike swift, swiftly without warning. That's their motto. And if you think about it, that's just what we did. Exactly. <laughs> you know, um, and that's, uh, that's who, that's how we were successful. I think the big thing is whatever the RLI scouts and sas did together i think was always a success um i don't think there was anything that was well planned i think everything was a professional so all in all uh a nice chat and i don't know if you want any more from me john i must agree uh, with you that um i think the rli I, in fact when you listen to all the interviews from all the different services, uh, you do get a sense of the professionalism that even young uh, officers, you know, who were, um, you know, young in terms of youth years, but they operated um, with a sense with a, with a real professionalism almost beyond their beyond their years, um, yeah. and, and there was a there was discipline. Um, and you you never saw the sort of raping and pillaging and type of things that you know went go on in most wars. You never saw that amongst the Rhodesian troops. They um, no. they apt, they were incredibly well disciplined and and principled. I think. Um, I mean, it was our country, and we loved our country, and we loved the people. Um, yeah. Uh, what was the point I was trying to make? Um, yeah, you know, here in South Africa, you can see that same brutality in the farm murders. We have this, uh, we have this um, uh, 
thing that's happening in this country, the, 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 the systematic murdering of farmers. And often there's no, there doesn't seem to be yeah, a robbery. Right. It doesn't seem to be a robbery motive. Sometimes they'll just, uh, they won't take anything. They just um, torture them and kill them. And we're talking about elderly people in their 80s, you know, being tortured and killed and just left there. Um, yes. And no money taken. Amazing. Yeah, I don't understand it. Well, I possibly I do, but I'm not going to venture any opinions on this. Correct. Uh, Correct. But the, the same thing happened in Rhodesia. It was a, it was a tactic. Uh, to achieve an end and uh, a, a horrific and one also has to take one's hat off to the to the farmers and their wives who you know Jesus. were in the bush on their own with nothing other than the you know the agri alert system <laughs> and and uh, yeah jimmy thank you so much for your time brother i really appreciate it and uh and Bloody think, hell. yeah they were so brave those people. Yeah.